I am Jacob Music. And I'm Sophia Mahavadova. And that was an interestingly long break. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Women in the Abrahamic Tradition series. And what are we focusing on today, Sophia? Uh, well, we, you and I had an interesting argument about men's rights. Uh, and that really prompted me. <laughs> was this like three months ago? Yes, it was like three months yeah, ago. Yeah, I, I, I have my reptile brain has no recollection of this. I don't even know what position yeah. I would have taken. But uh, the topic was... What are the responsibilities of both men and women in childbearing? And that created a nice jumping off point in my brain to the writings of Paul. I know we had gotten some of the way through the Gospels, but uh, we hadn't got to all of them. No. So I will go back and see which ones we haven't covered, and I'll tack them on to the end of the video series along with Esther. Um, but the important point is, we're actually making videos again. <laughs> I agree. I think that is the important point, too. And after, especially after one of our very long breaks. <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't, I, we can go check and I haven't actually checked to see how long the break has been. I don't know if we produced, did we produce anything in 2018? Uh, I think it was the early part of 2018. Okay, so we're coming at <laughs> more than a year. I think it's been pretty much a year. Yeah. I think it's been almost exactly a year. Yeah. Uh, but as I had said in our long since forgotten discussion about parenting, <laughs> the idea of what marriage and sexual relationships should be has historically been based on whether you're in an agricultural or a hunter-gatherer society. Um, and for agriculture based societies like those that were uh, that are existed in the general area of the Fertile Crescent for the last few thousand years just about anyone with any status was in an arranged marriage where the families decided who they were going to be married off to for financial reasons <laughs> and the people were more or less expected to have partners who they actually liked on the side as long as they were discreet about it and didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. So, in that kind of society, marriage and childbirth are property transactions in a very real way. <laughs> so, when we talk about marriage in the writings of Paul, Paul largely saw marriage in those kind of terms. And he saw it as, uh, in terms of the responsibilities that men and women had towards each other. He didn't seem to care very much about the love aspect of marriage. But that's, um, but that's where marriage comes from! <laughs> yeah. uh, exactly. Everyone knows that love is what marriage is all Legalized about. Legalized <laughs> love, Sophia. <laughs> As if it was ever illegal. <laughs> <laughs> When, when Paul does talk about sexuality within marriage, he sees it as distasteful, but recognizes that if the partners don't have sex with each other, they're going to have it outside the relationship, which in his opinion is a worse outcome. So besides the uh, you know different salutations and conclusions uh, at the beginning of end of all of his letters that include the names of both men and women, there are only two main passages where Paul actually talks about women in marriage. Uh, the first one is 1 Corinthians 7, and the second is Ephesians 5. Now, whether or not these were actually written by Paul is definitely something that could be debated. <laughs> I think but, it's something that has been and probably will be continued to be debated, and probably yes. will come out on the side, as of most biblical books, that... They were not usually written by one person, or they were not usually written by the person who it says they were, or they were, quote, written in the spirit of that person. Uh, let's go over 1 Corinthians 7 first, uh, starting at verse 1. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid, forn to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband, and let the husband bend her unto the wife, do benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. I feel um, like that the end of that is often forgotten. 
Yes. Why do I not hear about that when I watch all the preacher shows? Yeah, uh, that that is a very good point, and I'm going to be linking to a channel called Suris, S-U-R-I-S, where he discusses a lot of articles that are based on this, and none of them are very good. None of the modern preachings that come out about this are particularly empowering to women, and a lot of them seem to be smoke screens for abuse. I agree. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's shocking to me actually reading the, the last part of that fourth verse, because I had thought completely that these pastors were speaking about all that existed in the Bible, which was the first part. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that I've never heard about the last part of this one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It, it does tend to be forgotten in the modern discourse. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, resuming at verse 5, Deprive ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan may not tempt you for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this matter, and one after this manner, and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and to widows, it is good for them to abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. For it is better to marry than to burn. Burn with lust, maybe. Or perhaps more literally, to burn in hell. (laughs) But if you weren't Christian or you were a heretic, you were going to be burned anyway in the time that Christianity was most politically strong, so... I don't know. Burning. I, sometimes you didn't really have a choice. <laughs> yep. So, uh, but going back to the passage, there are a couple of things that are interesting um, besides the ones that we already pointed out. Paul here seems to think that not getting married is superior in a religious sense um, to being married, but he understands that people will have sex. So if they're going to have sex, then it's better for them to do it within marriage than for them to burn. Um, Like we said, either in lust or in hell. But what does Paul mean when he says that it is better to be like him? He could mean celibate, which is how most people would interpret it, but he could more controversially mean being gay. Okay, Sophia, explain this to us. What in the hell does this have to do with gay? We like bringing it up because we're godless queers. <laughs> well, I know that, but with regards to Paul, Paul is seen as such a prude and like a boring, like really establishment kind of figure. I mean, he's really anti-establishment because he's really, well, he's not really, but he's saying the ideal is not to do in marriage, which is society's norm, but most people can't contain themselves, which is celibacy. So you should go along with society. So what, where are we getting the gay part from? First, first that he doesn't really make it clear what does that mean to be like him. That's Most true. people will assume that it means celibacy, but it doesn't necessarily mean celibacy. Every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, one after another. <laughs> it, it seems to imply that it's not necessarily wrong to be made after one manner or another, if you read a bit into it of the modern <laughs> so. interpretation of the scriptures. I feel like that's kind of a struggle interpretation. <laughs> it is one that could be made, though. That's true. I mean, um, it could be argued not very strongly, I don't think. At least based on what we've seen. Yeah. It's not going to be argued by very many people, but no. it is one that could be argued. But weaker biblical claims are mainstream, so whatever. Yes. <laughs> May as well just but, say whatever you want at this point. Yeah. But um, what is clear is that he doesn't seem to... He does see marriage as being somewhat reciprocal, and he does seem to believe that men and women have obligations to each other, but uh, we'll get onto that later. Within our modern context, to say that a man or woman doesn't have the ability to consent or deny consent after marriage isn't something that most people would agree with, but it seems to be something that he at least somewhat believes when he says that they no longer have power over their own bodies. Yes. But he, but very interestingly, he also includes the woman. I mean, sorry, he also includes the man is not having power over his body either. Yes. Which we, I mean, we know very well in practice that that's not how it rolled out. 
in reality, but at least it's being said here in the verse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he does also seem to understand that even within marriage, people are going to cheat, which, as I had said earlier, it was pretty socially acceptable as long as you weren't open about it, as long as you weren't caught. And he does, like the rest of society at the time, seem to be against it. But he does seem to be acknowledging that it will happen if you, if, if there's no sex inside your marriage or the sex inside your marriage is not fulfilling, people do seem to want to go outside of your marriage. <laughs> they do seem to do that. That is true. <laughs> Returning to the passage at uh, verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart her husband, but but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest I speak, not the Lord, uh, but I. If a, any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And if the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, that, uh, and the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So here we start to get into the undeniably questionable nature of equality within Paul's view of it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't believe that the wife should be allowed to remarry if she leaves her husband or if her husband leaves her. But he never says the same about the husband being able to remarry. He sees divorce as a bad thing, but he doesn't seem to be arguing that men remarrying is an issue. And this gets back into the discussion of the negative side of the traditional agricultural society's view of marriage. Because it's a property transaction, just like a land sale, a woman, like a field, can be plowed or fallow. And this idea carries into our language today because without me <laughs> explaining the difference, I bet you know what it means. Yes. To plow a sexual partner is still a euphemism that can be easily understood to the modern listener. Absolutely. And for men, as the plow and not as the field, <laughs> cultivation isn't necessarily something that one can only do for a single field. And this is kind of partly based on human biology. Um, a single plot of land can only grow one, gro- one crop during the growing season, but a single plow can be used to till many plots of land during that same <laughs> growing season. And a human woman can only reproduce, reproduce at a rate of about once a year. But a single man could, in theory, at least, create <laughs> every more planet in the same amount of time. There are a lot of reasons why that wouldn't happen. Yes, including <laughs> you, you would not be plowed. And, uh, th- you know, there are a lot of reasons why we don't have the super chat of the year. <laughs> <laughs> and, With this uh, pink shirt and green pants. Yes. <laughs> But he's very ripped, though. He's very masculine. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that blonde mohawk. That's why he's able to get all the Stacys. He's so (laughs) masculine. (laughs) Totally doesn't look gay. (laughs) About the physical possibility of it happening. Women are the limiting factor of human reproduction. And they always have been. So for societies like the one that Paul found himself in, Reproductive success of your community was based on controlling women. Just like a field, if a woman was left fallow for a time, the ownership didn't become public domain. She was still the property of her ex-husband, and he had the right to reclaim and cultivate the land. However, if a man moved to a different city and bought a new field, there was no reason why he shouldn't plow his new field while he was away from the other, because if he didn't cultivate either field, he'd starve. So in Paul's mind, for reproduction and thereby society to keep going meant allowing men freedom in sexual partners while controlling the sexual activity of women. You know, it's interesting because on the one hand, he does, um, Paul shifts in a direction where he expresses that his ideal or the Christian ideal should be 
towards abstinence, but on the other hand, he also gives you know gives himself an out. So he's basically saying that you know he's pulling up an ideal, yet at the same time he's saying almost nobody can fulfill the ideal in our tradition. So you can just go ahead and do this. So it's not really revolutionary at all. It's just kind of quasi revolutionary. And what is the most interesting is not with the majority of people who would, of course, just follow, um, you know, traditional agricultural, um, um, like, like chattel marriage kind of. Um, it would be those few people who actually did follow this commandment to see what form their lives took in terms of abstinence and partnership in, in, without fornication. We're going to get into that. <laughs> Good, because there's uh, some homo romantic stuff in that, possible in that paradigm. <laughs> Uh, so before reading the next section, um, I need to add a brief explanation. When you hear the word virgin, it's not what we mean by the word today, which is a statement on whether or not someone has had sex. Instead, what is meant is a woman who has a marriage contract, but that marriage has not yet been consummated. So it's not a, it's not a virgin in the sense of she hasn't had sex necessarily. It's a virgin in the sense of she is a man's wife but they have not had sex. So, back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, starting at verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one who hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. And it, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives should live as though they have none. And those who weep as though they wept not. And those that rejoice as though they rejoice not. And those that buy as though they possess not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is married careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, how she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not to cast a snare on you, but for that which is comely, that ye may attend to the Lord without distraction. But if any man think that he behaves uncomely towards his virgin, and that she pass the flower of her age, and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, and hath no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So then he that takes her in marriage doeth well, but he that taketh her not in marriage doeth better. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if the husband is dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But if she is happier, if but she is happier if she so abide after my judgment, and I think also that I have the spirit of God. So there are so many things that can be said about this passage, passages we just read. I just wanted to say, was specifically with regards to uh, here we go, thirty-one, and they that use this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. So this in this paradigm, we have to look at this scripture as being one in of many of most in the early Christian tradition, you know, they hadn't really been, when this was written, they hadn't been um, canonized in, in any sort of fashion um, that we would have recognized. But basically Jesus was prophesying that the world was going to end basically by the year 100. Like it was, it was, it, it was imminent. The world was ending. The last days were here. The people hearing him were among the last people. So in a sense, Paul is laying down a law as if he were to expect humanity in the world to continue, but he's also seems to be maintaining that earlier Christian um, 
millennialism that the world, you know, you can go along and act as if you have a family and act as if you're husband and wife and act as if that's real. But this will all passeth away because the world is ending and Jesus will return. I mean, so he he's taking another duality and he kind of allows himself to like say to, you know, kind of have two tracks going on in his words. So he's very like, um, I don't know. I mean, he's he's authoritarian in a sense, but he's also kind of like, I don't know. This The passage to me seems unsure because, uh, you know, allegedly, you know, we have from indications in other parts of the New Testament that they really did believe the world was going to end. But I think there is reason to believe that some people came in and added um, more establishment laws and more establishment passages to these different scriptures um, to, to take Christianity into something that could be used to replicate traditional society. Yeah, and I believe that it is within um, First Corinthians itself that he has an entire long passage about the dead in Christ shall rise first, which is dealing with the fact that, oh, uh-oh, people who we expected to be alive until the end yes. of time are yes. dying. Yes, you know, <laughs> which was one of the first the um, <laughs> problems that Christ that institutional Christianity faced. Yes, it was a huge problem for them, and so. You know, I think that you're right, that this is being written in a transition period. where they're like, uh-oh, the world hasn't ended yet. Whoops, uh, we didn't expect that to happen. We didn't expect that to happen. Oh, no. Now we have to prepare for a living. <laughs> now women shall be plowed until the end of the earth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I guess we can't stop them from having sex while they're waiting for the world to end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the longer you wait for the world to end, the worse it just gets, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's just actually. Off way. <laughs> I kind of, yeah, especially for them in, in their age. It just seemed to get worse and worse. Um, but yeah, so um, that's, and, and then there's also towards the end, it's interesting that he claims that he has the spirit of God. So he's obviously portraying himself as a spiritual authority. Not only that, he says that he has the spirit of God. And so... This was probably due to break down any resistance of anything that did contradict either words that Jesus said, um, things that we don't know that were not written down that contradicted this Paul scripture, or uh, things that were actually uh, disregarded as non-canon. Yeah. Um, and the things that I wanted to point out about um, this wall of text is the first, the first thing that stood out to me is that it assumes that most men, or at least the men who are able to read this letter or who are going to have it read to them, are of the class that will have arranged marriages mm -hmm. and will have some degree of choice in those marriages. A slave, for example, wouldn't have that kind of luxury. Yeah, and so this, would, this passage in terms of its uh, law would be irrelevant. To, yeah, to slaves. Unless they, would, they chose to be abstinent, but then again, they were probably forced to reproduce. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's possible they were forced to reproduce. I don't know about the specifics. I know in American slavery, people were forced to reproduce. No, that was very, it was extremely common in Greece as well. So Greece and Rome and all of those. So they have a lot of to them, it kind of wouldn't even be a choice at all. So from the very beginning, Christianity is not sort of the peasants and the slaves religion, especially yes, it when it's is. written down and, and written texts up until very recently have a um, higher class uh, um Bias, anyways, you? just for the very fact of the, those are the people that could read. Yeah, even if you weren't um, right, e even if you weren't a slave, you were probably too poor. To the legit, the actual origin life. of the <laughs> the word proletarian, where you were just a worker who kind of was in between having nothing and being a citizen. Yes, that was. Yeah, exactly. There, there were a lot of people in that position, and Paul and, doesn't. Seem and proletarian hard. actually, you know, indicates that you know means the only property that you had were your children and your wife. Yeah, and and for in reading the burial documents, there are a lot of uh, shall I say unusual relationships. Um, there's one in Rome of a woman who lived with two husbands throughout her life. And when she died, her two husbands wrote a very touching eulogy for her, which we still have. Oh, wow. Um, that is about, you know, her two husbands who loved her. And uh, after she died, they went their separate ways. But 
there were a lot of unconventional marriages. And it's so interesting because the media and, and kind of people today, they are seeing things such as polyamory as inventions of postmodernism when it's such a joke because it's completely the opposite. Um, alternative Absolutely. arrangements are coming literally like straight out of Rome and Greece. Yeah. And, and probably before that. And and also it needs to be said in parallel, hunter-gatherer societies were, had their whole other um, array of different family systems. But even in tradi quote, traditional marriage societies that are based on agrarianism, like there have been differences in family structure literally from the beginning. Yeah. And a lot of it was based on your class. And Paul is writing to the upper class here because he's writing to the class that is going to be able to have a wife and not be really married to her. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it, it, it requires a certain amount of privilege to avoid being married also. It, talking to those people who would be of God. Um, because, you know, like we said, people, some people were forced to, a lot of, most people probably were forced to. And so if you were someone that was going to forego that for religious reasons, you had to have a certain amount of privilege that would isolate you from having to get married. Absolutely. And we're going to get into the legality of this. It was the man's decision, whether he chose to consummate the marriage or he chose to keep his wife as a virgin. It's all his decision. At no point does the wife's opinion factor in. You could interpret the line about if she passed the flower of her age and the need so required to be kind of her putting pressure on him because she feels her biological clock ticking. But at the end of the day, it's still his decision. Mm -hmm. You know, even if she feels that the needs so require, he can still keep her as a virgin forever. Um, which, which was said to be the more godly thing, correct? Exactly. And... There's no talk about what a woman should do. There's there's nothing about what a woman should do if she finds her husband to be aging and she, and he wants children, but she wants to stay single. Mm -hmm. That is still his decision. The only time the woman is allowed to decide whether or not she wants to be married or who she wants to be married to is after she's already been widowed. Now, the average life expectancy being what it was at that time, that wasn't terribly uncommon especially when the area wasn't in a state of peace. If there was a war, there was a very good chance that your young <laughs> fit husband was being drafted into the military and dying. But there was still a reasonable chance that, you know, if he won the war, he might come back. Winning sides in those battles tended to only lose about 5% of their forces. Well, the losing side would generally suffer losses of about 30%. So that's did did modern warfare increase the numbers of mortality? I'm not entirely sure. On a guess, I would say no. But for the winning side, the, I would say that the, the numbers are probably much less. Okay. Although, looking at World War I... Yeah, I mean, there I'm thinking of World War One, World War Two, absolute atrocities where the, the the weaponry is just so much more powerful than anything we had before, and like poison gas was used, and etc. Yeah, so in those wars, I would say that probably the number was was far higher than even. The I guess what we call like total war. Yeah, the whole you can choose who you marry after you've already been widowed or otherwise become unmarriageable. That wasn't uncommon in the area. So he was not being a revolutionary here. <laughs> um, so, for example, in the Code of Hammurabi, some 1,800 years prior to this, they also had arranged marriages but allowed widows and prostitutes to pick their own husbands. Yeah, yeah, gang, gang, gang. <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, the Code of Hammurabi, um, what should we call it? Law number 184, if a man do not give a dowry to his daughter, if then her father die, her brother shall give her a dowry according to her father's wealth and, and secure a husband for her. And in uh, number 177, it says, if a widow whose children are not grown wishes to enter another house or remarry, she shall not enter it without the knowledge of the judge. If she enter another house, the judge shall examine the state of the house of her first husband, then the house of her first husband shall be entrusted to the second husband and to the woman herself as managers. 
and a record shall be made thereof. She shall keep the house in order, bring up the children, and not sell the household utensils. Mm. He, who, he who buys the utensils of the children of a widow shall lose his money, and goods shall be returned to their owners, i.e. the children. Okay. Um, and because inheritance is passed through the father in the Code of Hammurabi, that was very important, because their stepfather wasn't didn't have a lot of legal obligation to them. Mm-hmm. So it was very necessary for them to have uh, the inheritance of their actual father. So these kind of laws had already been in place by for literally millennia by the time of fall. But in his own lifetime, the status of marriage in Roman law was also undergoing some serious reforms. For example, in Lex Julia, the <laughs> Lex <laughs> Julia de Mirtandis, or did not, or, fuck it, after some Roman words. <laughs> Lex Julia de Martanidis or Dinibus. Great job. <laughs> um, and its revision, the Lex Papia Papea, I could say that one. Much easier. <laughs> Uh, the Roman government had put fines on people who were unmarried Boo. and had and they had also granted special legal, legal privileges Jesus Christ. to both No, not to Jesus Christ. No, I'm Jesus. saying I'm 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 I'm, I'm <laughs> reacting in forward time to what you were about to say. Cuz even today it's ridiculous. So they had put fines on the people who were unmarried and granted special legal privileges to both men and women who had at least five children, not how, necessarily with each other. How? Oh, not necessarily with each other. Okay. Because so I was going to say, what in the world are the chances of having five living children? Well, they didn't have to be living. You just had to have birth. Oh, they didn't have to be living. Okay, never mind. I get it. <laughs> you just have to almost die five times as the as the wife. And then you get a medal. <laughs> <laughs> You're a gold star woman, even though all your children may have died, and you almost died. Yes. So, these laws were seen as necessary to, due to the declining birth rate among the nobility. The birth rate among the poor hadn't really declined. But the birth rate among especially the Italian elites had gone into serious decline. And so, they felt that it was necessary to pass laws that encouraged marriage... This, this included you could marry a widow. Oh, totally so they're opening hard. it up a little bit because they're desperate. Also divorce. Divorce was not as stigmatized in Roman law as it was under Paul. Um, I will probably, if I can find it again, link to a documentary about the topic of divorce and remarriage in Roman law at the time. So, <coughs> so that is interesting, too. Um... But these laws were, like I said, seen as necessary due to the declining birth rate. Betrothal, which we were talking about earlier, was legally limited to two years, and girls under the age of 10 were forbidden from being engaged, presumably because the legal age of consent in marriage was 12. So if you married a woman who was under the age of 10, then, or a girl who was under the age of 10, rather than, then, your engagement would go on for more than two years, and that was an unacceptable loophole. <laughs> <laughs> there were also um, a set of laws that permitted husbands to kill or arrest adulterers who they caught in the act and charging them with, um, and the law also would charge these husbands with being a pimp if they failed to do so. So if you. Wait, the husband or the adulterer? Yeah. The husband. The husband would be charged with being a pimp? Yes. That's some so stupid if, shit. That that sounds like the stupid sex sex um, work laws we have today. Yeah, so if you walked in on your wife with another man and you, for whatever reason, didn't either murder or arrest that guy mm-hmm. and divorce your wife within three days, you were charged with being a pimp. <laughs> what the fuck? I mean, we do know a lot, especially, I mean, it's coming out, not because it's newly developing, I don't think, because it's just becoming, we're at a more liberalized time, but a lot of men do, breaking news, like to see their their wife with other men. So, um, 
I guess there was that threat that it would be titillating and that they wouldn't report it. I can't imagine anyone being a cuck in ancient Oh, yeah, there's, that doesn't exist at all. What a myth. Cuckoldry was such a myth. Cuckoldry was illegal. Um, but what if they all... But what... I don't know. Never mind. That's a dumb law. Let's continue. Declining birth rate um, among the elites especially was causing the problem of the lack of children in um, their society mm -hmm. to be seen as an, uh, increasingly as an existential threat to the existence of the Roman state. But these laws were not excessively popular. And it's not known how successful they actually were at increasing the birth rate. <laughs> mm -hmm. How long were these laws in effect? Do you know? Um, from the time of Lex Julia to the time of Lex Papia Papea was under one lifetime. Lex Papia Papea Oh, was, okay. Lex Papia Papea, um, the revision of the Lex Julia, was proposed by two senators, Papia and Papea. <laughs> who were both bachelors. Really? Mm-hmm. And so that re-inscribed re these laws, or that replaced these laws? It replaced Lex Julia and reduced some of the uh, more stricter... Okay, so this is like, not like hundreds of years of law. This was literally like a couple decades. This was within Paul's lifetime. Okay, wow. So this is really not that effective at all. I mean, not that long-standing at all. No. But Lex Papia Papea, they were still marriage reform laws. They were just not as strict as Lex Julia. Under Lex Julia, the emperor had banished his own daughter. Was that Julia? That was how... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Julia is referring to uh, Julius Caesar. Oh, but... okay, okay. His daughter was caught in bed with a man who was not her husband, and he had to banish her from the Jesus from Christ, the back before that, usually the nobility could get away with that kind of shit. Oh, yeah. There were other emperors who were themselves pimps, notoriously so. Or, and <laughs> prostitutes. And prostitutes. Repping yeah. out my Helio Globalis. <laughs> Helio Ga I can never pronounce any of the forms of his name. Helio Globalis, I think it is. Oh, no, it's a Lagabalus, isn't it? I am not sure. Okay, never mind. But it's like Helio Gabalus slash Alagabalus, who was actually a prostitute. Um, there, was, there was one Roman emperor who was famously a transgender woman. <laughs> who was that? Oh, let me look it up. Maybe it was the same person. Gender Roman emperor. Yeah, I know that. Well, I know this person. Yes, it was. Yeah, Pelagamus. same guy. Yeah, he did not last very long and was not very popular. So you could push it too far. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Coming home, jingling the coins you made from fucking uh, non-royalty that night was not going down well. Yeah. <laughs> Which is something he allegedly actually did. Although I honestly think most of it was made up. And but, he was assassinated. I mean, I would like to believe it was true, but it just sounds too good to be true. Yes. Now he's still a patron saint of mine. To the Roman government, um, which was doing as much as it could, even at the risk of being incredibly unpopular and banishing the emperor's daughter, uh, just to increase the birth rate, this new religion that actively encouraged people not to marry must have seemed like a threat to their authority. And on the flip side, for the early Christians, was the decision not to marry really an act of piety, or was it a minor act of rebellion against the state? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly it, would, it could be understand, understood as both. But we also know just inherently that it was the minority of people who took that godly route. Yeah, it was. Well, I mean... Very few of us in the world are asexual. <laughs> or even, do you think it was just people who were asexual, or did it include some other people who, for other reasons who, um... I'm who, sure that just like today, there were a lot of people who took vows of celibacy for various reasons, mm -hmm. and most of them probably weren't asexual, but... Okay. Uh, you know... As we have seen with the Catholic Church, some of those reasons might be 
say, homosexuality. Or pedophilia. <laughs> or pedophilia, for example. You want to fuck children? May as well just allegedly become celibate. That's not going to go wrong. Or like my mom's ex-girlfriend, you could just be, you know, a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't count if it's not a dick. <laughs> True fact, my mom dated a uh, lesbian nun for about... <laughs> a lesbian years. nun, I love it. <laughs> yep. God, your family. But there is always, I mean... It's she dated Denise for like two and a half years until Denise was defrocked, probably for their relationship. <laughs> she dropped her once she was defrocked? Yes. <laughs> I think what, what, what uh, appealed to my mom about that relationship was probably the fact that her girlfriend was a nun. <laughs> probably. I think she had liked that. And then once she brought her girlfriend the cost of actual not becoming a nun. She was like, I'm not interested. <laughs> yes. <laughs> fascinating. Yes. Uh, on a slightly less fascinating note, <laughs> 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 back to the Bible. <laughs> uh, and our next passage is Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. Wives, Submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Which on, as uh, the channel service, which I mentioned earlier, will show you, includes giving him your passwords. <laughs> giving him your passwords? And he may, you may not demand his passwords. Yeah. Well, but this also, I need to say, Sophia, okay, verse 22, doesn't that contradict with what we read earlier, I believe, in Corinthians, saying that one is the keeper of the other in both directions? The Bible contradicting itself? <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> oh, okay. So what's the explanation? <laughs> Oh, you know, I always ask you, how do these, how do the modern Christians explain away this contradiction? Because I have to say, going back to what I said before, I know I said it earlier, but I hear wives submit to your husbands, wives submit to your husbands, wives submit to your husbands. It is godly to do that. But I don't hear that the wife is the keeper of the husband or that they have to submit to each other. Why do, I mean, how do they explain away the other, the other verse? I'm sure it's not misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, women, you are just the one to be plowed. It's just the way it is. So, but what if your husband <laughs> likes to get fucked in the ass? Questions not <laughs> answered by the Bible. Definitely not. <laughs> Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he may present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what men to love their wives as their own bodies? He that loveth his wife loveth himself, although I'm sure he could love himself just well, just as well without his wife. <laughs> Here's another verse here. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Suicide, not a thing. I was going to say also religious self-flagellation, apparently not a thing. Not a thing, no. For also man, Jesus giving himself up to be killed, apparently not a thing. No. Nah. He nourishes his own body and cherishes it, as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. I love how that, that really is, we're seeing even less revolutionary material from the origins of Christianity. It's, it's, it's comporting Christianity even closer in alignment to traditional society by taking what used to be, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Well, it, it's almost like the beginning sounds like, um, the the call to leave and become a disciple where you leave society, you leave the traditional you know strictures. Yet at the back it says, 
to be in traditional marriage, to be joined upon his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So it's taking this revolutionary, like, Elan and putting it back into whatever it would have been anyways before Christianity. But this is a great mystery. It's a, it's a great story? Oh, okay, sure. Sure, Sophia, whatever. If, if we scroll down to verse 32, it says so. This is a great mystery. <laughs> oh, it's not a mystery. I just revealed it. <laughs> <laughs> in the church <laughs> so this is setting us up for we know that we're being hypocrites and we're changing the 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 um the values of this tradition and this radical tradition we're taming it down for society but if anyone challenges us we can quote this is a great mystery mm -hmm. nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay, this fucking thing <laughs> is worse. <laughs> Ephesians is obviously worse than Corinthians. Yes. I'm not saying that Ephesians is definitely the one that is considered to be less authentic by the various scholars of this thing, but... <laughs> I mean, but is it? I mean, authentic, I mean, that whole, I, I don't see, I mean, we, this is a whole nother thing, but like, the fact that if you're not like Christian and you were to take any of these as being wholly authentic, I don't see how you could even think any of them were authentic in some sort of st strict sense. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me to think that they weren't changed, not by someone other than the person who allegedly wrote them. I mean, come on. Yeah. Especially having them in English. I mean, okay, and then going back and saying, oh, no, it was perfectly translated. Every physical copy was a perfect reproduction of the one before it. I'm like, who two. can make that argument you people do? I have two questions for King James the only purists. <laughs> <laughs> now that movement is hilarious as fuck. Question number one, who was King James? Uh, well, you know what? You should ask Steve. What the fuck is his name? Steve. My, one of my favorite pastors, the guy who screams about fags. Steve. I forgot his name. Shit. He's a really good King James only independent uh, Baptist fundamentals uh, uh, movement. Is that, um, um, Stephen Anderson. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. That was who I was just going to say. What is that the guy who was uh, friends with, um, Oh, Kent Hovind, and it is. Oh, is I want to have dirty, dirty sex with Steve Anderson. Dirty <laughs> hate sex with Steve Anderson. With or without Kent Hovind. How do you spell his last name? Let me see if he's hot. H-O-V-I-N-D. Oh, Hovind. Oh. Oh. Why does that look like a mugshot? It is. He was in jail. Oh! <laughs> Flat Earth. Oh, he believes in the Flat Earth? Oh, God. I didn't know that. He, he believes in a lot of ridiculous stuff. And he's got he's got a bromance going on with Steve Anderson. There is, an, is this really his quote? There is no such thing as a circle? Uh, Probably. Okay, well, I mean, technically there's not a circle. He, oh, wait, the okay. late he died? Wait. This is the late. Oh, maybe it's just making fun of him. The late great. Talking about, no, he didn't die. Oh my God, criminal penalty, 10 years imprisonment? Uh, oh, he created that's... Dinosaur Adventureland? Yes. Oh, that's from my home state of Florida. Uh, this, oh, of this course it was genius. tax. I don't need to pay taxes. <laughs> yes. This genius. <laughs> genius. He created Dinosaur Adventureland. Within weeks of getting out of jail, he was selling cyanide. You've got to be kidding me. I wish. Potholer 54. Potholer 54 has a video that explains that he is literally selling cyanide as a, pretending it's a vitamin B something or other. I will link that video. Oh, because, God. Right. See, they, I don't, why can't he just do it like everyone else does it and do it basically shitty stuff, but at least do it within the confines of the law and make a bajillion dollars? Is he just really bad at it? Because everyone's selling fucking supplements these days, even though they're, they're pretty much useless. He 
remarried. He did that remarry. Is, I see that. Mary Taco. That is amazing. Because before he, his remarriage, he was very anti that. He I am shocked that he doesn't have woman. integrity, Sophia. Are you telling me that Dinosaur Adventureland is based on a, a family of fornicators? His wife left him, his wife Johoban, left him right after he got out of jail, possibly because of STDs. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> oh my yes. God, I am DrDino.com, that's him. Dinosaur <laughs> Adventureland. Wow. Creationists have moved on from him. They said his arguments are those that they used years ago and they long, no longer believe them. Well, of course they moved on years ago. He was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> ah! Wow. Uh, this is, yeah, I don't want to threesome with him. I'm just going to state that. But I want to have dirty, no, no. dirty sex of Steve Anderson fucking me, hate fucking me. What about... And then crying. I want him to finish and then start crying. Okay. If, if you don't want to include Ken Hoban, would you include one of his dinosaur toys? Um, I, obviously. I mean, how else am I going to DP... Um, I mean, how, how else am I going to get DP'd if it's just Steve without a dinosaur dildo? Or I can Which stick it up his ass. No, I can stick it up his ass and then, and then he can really have a good time. Oh my gosh. When this goes into the Cirrus Discord, hi Cirrus Discord, which I, which dinosaur dino would you like to have sex with? It's like it's Steve Anderson with. <laughs> are, wait, is are you asking me or are you asking people? I'm asking the viewers. The viewers, okay, <laughs> viewers, yeah. I mean, Steve Anderson's hot and he screams and he hits things. That's hot. <laughs> Duh. That's so manly to scream and hit things and get mad. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my basic mo my basic motor just starts running, and he has he has like a closely shaved head like that's hot. But there's nothing for you to grab onto. <laughs> I know. I know. That's why I just have to just grab onto him. <laughs> um, see, my sexual brain's not very good at imagining these. <laughs> Except it does. It is creative when you're not. Um, when you are not. Um, um, Conscious, it is somewhat creative. Yes, my, my subconscious mind is very creative. Whips and a New York penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Whips and a New York penthouse. Very perky tits on the on the hooker that I very she were they fake? Hooker. She was a if she was an escort. She was, a, she was were they fake tits perky. or were they perky real tits? J-cups aren't naturally that perky. <laughs> J-cups? Holy shit! Yeah, lesbian, you love big tits. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, uh, for those who, who don't know, I, I seem to have a split brain. Um, and the part a of my brain... split that brain? Have, That's so funny. I, I seem... To put it another way, I seem to have serious brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> So I have all of the symptoms of serious damage to the corpus callosum. I haven't gotten it tested because that's very low on my list of medical priorities. Yes, and I would agree with that after what as of late. Yes. Um, so I have a lot of surgeries and stuff that I need done way before that. And since it can't probably be fixed, there's no point. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's on the bottom of the list. Um, and, but as a result, I seem to apparently have a split brain and the left half of my brain, which is the part that I refer to as me, <laughs> because it's the only part that can talk to you. <laughs> left brain is asexual. She is very strictly asexual, mm -hmm. but right brain is apparently very lesbian. Like cravenly lesbian. J cup tits. <laughs> J cup tits. Like loves pig tits. Has sex dreams all the time. Pretty often. <laughs> loves escorts. That's hilarious. Uh, who was it that she liked with tits? 
Who is I it? Think she... Benedict Cumberbatch that she liked with tits. <laughs> oh, so she likes guys but with tits. Okay. No, I think she liked him if she, if he was a woman. If he was a woman, <laughs> she would like him. She liked the gender bended version of him. So, but did she did she want um what did she want a hermaphrodite or did she want a with tits and a pussy or did she want with tits and a dick? His face with tits and a pussy. <laughs> oh, okay. So literally his face on a girl. Yes. <laughs> That's an interesting choice. Yeah, I thought so. That is definitely a choice. (laughs) Choice and a half, if I may say it. So, yeah, lesbian brain. (laughs) Poor her. (laughs) Poor lesbian brain will never be satisfied. I'm not satisfied with her being (laughs) in (laughs) brain. But, I mean, there's nothing either of us can really do about it. Probably. And since I'm the only one who can hit on people, and I'm not very good at that as an asexual, she's just going to be stuck and frustrated. <laughs> yep. Sorry, lesbian brain. What, what, what were you we even talking about now? <laughs> um, I think we were... Um... Something um, about... Well, it, it, went from the, it went from the Bible and being in contradiction with itself to somehow we started talking about Benedict Cumberbatch with a pussy. <laughs> so, Benedict, Benedict Cumbersnatch. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's a ton of people who really have that fetish. People love him. I don't <laughs> see the the like interest, to be honest. Did you watch the Turing movie? No. You should watch the Turing movie. Uh, yeah, I probably should, but I don't really watch a lot of movies. Just horror and porno. Oh, and Lifetime movies. I've watched I've watched like three Lifetime movies this month. He's literally being a gay man in that movie. I know, but it's just like so hard for me to get interested in like other movies. Like I don't care. Mm. I saw it in the theater with Danny, my ex-husband, and I liked it. He got mad at himself for liking it because that's faggotry. Oh, yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, definitely one of my favorite people that I've never met. Yes. Not. You haven't met him. Uh, no, okay. I've not met him. <laughs> not talked to him. I've seen pictures of him. Because we both lived in Maryland at the same time, so... I, thought I never met that. him, no. I never met Danny. I just heard things. Like Danny, Paul doesn't see love as mutual. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that both parties ideally should have for each other. Um, just like in our earlier passage, the wife's opinion and consent really wasn't that important. Um, and instead, the man should love the woman... And through his wise oversight, decides what's best for her. And women are just supposed to accept that their husband's decisions will be correct for them. But this is itself somewhat rebellious against the status quo and Roman law. Uh, Roman law had wives being subject to the decisions of their fathers and not the decisions of their husbands. While a husband was not permitted to kill his wife for adultery, her father was expected and he was permitted and even expected to kill her. Oh, my God. Well, divorce wasn't stigmatized and women apparently remarried quickly and frequently, the wife remained under the jurisdiction of her father throughout her life. So Paul's edicts may have seemed traditionalist and conservative to the people from the Fertile Crescent, but to the Romans, they were taboo and risque. And this, again, must have seemed like a minor act of rebellion against religion. Agreed. Yep. If not, you know, by the early Christians, then by the state, it definitely was. <laughs> so, Jacob, any yes. concluding thoughts? Well, I'm sitting here thinking of how unattracted I am to Benedict Cumberbatch. And <laughs> of the very few people with vaginas that I would be interested. It certainly would not be him. And actually, honestly, he'd probably be on, be on the end of the list. So that's my final concluding thought. <laughs> <laughs> What's your concluding thought? Well, trying to rein this into some semblance of topic. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've honestly probably said all that I I said quite a bit. I was blabbing a lot during that, so. But um, the reason that... You know, I see this series as so important and interesting. It is important. It, 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 it isn't necessarily about the modern status um, of Judaism or Christianity. Even or though I, I do see it, like we said last time, I see it as uber relevant. Yeah. 
we um, and you know we still see very real consequences. I mean, look at marriage. Look at the marriage, the structure of marriage we have today. It's very much similar to what we're talking about here as traditional quote Pauline marriage. Yeah, and you know this this series isn't necessarily about the dogma or the modern politics to me. Just talking about the ancient laws and the cultures that, you know, were alive at the time that these books were written, it shines a new light onto these familiar texts, and hopefully it can help people experience them in a new way. Absolutely, is- and I think the people that can gain the most out of this, if they ignore us talking about dicks and pussies, is actual Christians and Jews and Muslims, Because, but I think mostly Christians, just due to what we've talked about, because honestly, a lot of people who are so into the Bible and so into these prophets and so into this and that piece of doctrine and whatever have no context outside of a modern Christian biblical like tradition. They have no context and no idea of what these ancient societies were actually like. So how in the world could they possibly contextualize the Bible as anything other than them in their own society looking at it. Most Christians have no idea at all about the Greco-Roman civilization that Christianity found itself um, intruding upon. They have so low um, knowledge about this or Jewish society. Yeah. I mean, how how many modern Christians do you think have heard of the law of Lex Papia Papia? (laughs) Yeah, zero. Okay, like one, probably. And and so, yeah, th- that's what this series is about, is helping people recontextualize the things that they've grown up with, the things that are familiar, in a way that is perhaps more true to the actual history. And also, like, you know, it is such a favorite saying, you know, Christianity was revolutionary. I'm not denying this 100%. Christianity was revolutionary, and that's why Rome tried to get it. It's like... Well, it's not as revolutionary as you think it is. And if you just say Christianity was a completely, you know, a social kind of force upon the the Roman Empire and the Mediterranean world. Well, they made a lot of concessions really soon and really extremely, as noted from these canonical scriptures. So it's not as revolutionary as people would portray it to be, at least in its um, from a very early on. I'll concede that. But after that, no. As soon as it was, as Christian scriptures were being written down, they were being revised to be more accepted. Absolutely. Because look, if they were really followed, there probably would be like nobody reproducing. (laughs) And that we we know that didn't happen. Yeah. There were some celibate Christian communities, but it was not, it's not the overall, you know, direction of the Christian tradition because the world ended up not ending and human society had to go on. Exactly. And, you know, I, I think it's just really important for people to understand that whatever they have grown up hearing, there was a context that these people, you know, Paul and whoever else was writing these texts, they also grew up in a society. <laughs> they also yeah, they did. grew up mm-hmm. hearing things. And... That was important to their lives. That was as important to their lives as the stuff that you grew up hearing was important to you. And you may think that you're such a close follower of the Bible, you're such a devout Christian, you follow Paul's example, etc. But what does that really mean to you? And are you taking in the original context of the ancient society in which he lived? You know, that's what, that's why this series is important to me. It's not necessarily about religion. It's not necessarily about religious people. It's about bringing back this context that has been lost over the centuries. And that's what history teaching should really be. It should really be contextual. Because without it, it's disconnected from the actual live plane in which it played itself out. Thank you for joining us for this uh, episode. Where can this be viewed? This can be viewed on my YouTube channel, which is Sophia, S-A-F-I-A, Mohamedova, M-U-K-H-A-M-A. And if you are listening on SoundCloud, this is Voice of the Revolution Radio. I'm Jacob Music. Thank you very much to Sophia. And what will be our next chapter in this series? 
one of the many articles that I wrote online. <laughs> Sounds good. Article she wrote online. Sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Allahu Akbar. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>